We'll just jump right into it if you're good with that. Yeah, go ahead. Awesome. Well, David, welcome. We're excited to chat with you today. Welcome to OPN Ask an Angel. And uh, today, well, and what we always do is we love chatting with early stage investors. We want to find out more about what you're all about and the things that you look into so that we can help our community and the rest of the world, one, find you, and two, learn a bit more about what investors are looking for. Awesome. So to start off, the fastest, easiest way for us to jump right into this is if you could give us a little bit of a background on yourself, kind of where you've come from, where you're at today, what you're looking for in the future, and then one thing about you that nobody would know, that's kind of to wrap that all up. Oh boy, um, okay. Well, the short history is um, I, uh, I'm in the Southern California area. I've been here since 1985. Um, I'm in the San Fernando Valley, which is the famous suburb of Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, in particular, I now live in the city of Calabasas, which is just over the hill from Malibu. So it's basically in the Malibu Hills. And um, I had a career that was mostly in finance and insurance. I have built and exited four separate um, mid-size companies around that space uh, from an insurance retail distribution network to a premium finance company, which I sold to a credit union, to a auto finance company, uh, which I started and built for 18 years and then sold to um, a East Coast competitor who wanted to expand out West. And the largest of them was an insurance company, uh, insurance underwriter that um, underwrote non-standard auto insurance in California, Alliance United Insurance Company, which I sold to Kemper in 2014. Um, and um, since then, and since before then, um, I went back to my technology roots. Um, I'm a computer science major and double major of math and comp sci by original training. And, uh, uh, did a lot with software in general, always followed technology. And it seemed like, we, you know, we were at an amazing inflection point with AI and uh, IOT and the convergence of all and 5G and the convergence of all these things coming in to say it's going to be a really exciting time for innovation and technology. So um, I started following the whole startup scene in Silicon Valley um, going to conferences, attending, um, starting to invest through funds and syndicates and talking to a lot of people who are investing in Silicon Valley and started following along, eventually started to get my own deal flow. And that turned into wanting to do it more down in LA and joined a bunch of angel groups down here. So I'm a very active member in Tech Coast Angels, the Los Angeles chapter and in Pasadena Angels, and at Pasadena Angels now, I'm also a board member, so I'm helping out a little bit with the leadership, and I'm also on the selection committee. So I'm sure we'll talk about this more later, but when I'm look, um, I've also along the way started a fund back at the end of 2019, I started a fund called Emerging Ventures, and I have about 30 LPs in the fund who get to co-invest with me because, you know, being in angel groups, I was starting to refer a lot of friends and associates to the groups and realized that angel investing to me seems like fun, but it's actually a lot of work. And not everyone wants to do that, wanted to put into work. And uh, the worst thing you can do, I believe, for a casual you know, civilian is refer them to be an angel on one or two deals. Uh, that does a disservice. Uh, it, it's well documented that uh, individual deals are highly risky, but as an asset class, a diversified basket does not need to be. A diversified basket of angel investments, of early stage startup investments, can actually have a very steady, predictable return. Um, uh, you just need a large enough sample size. It's the same thing like the law of large numbers in insurance. It's no different than insurance. Uh, one car is a gamble. One risk is a gamble. A basket that's large enough is not a gamble. It's business, it's predictable, it's analytics. And uh, that's why the fund economics make more sense than one-up deals. If someone's a hobbyist, if someone is gonna 
just take dabble in angel investing, they're better off going into a, a fund and letting a professional make the selection so they're not hit with the adverse selection, but also so to get the diversification. Uh, let someone else choose a basket. And that's where I felt I can help my friends best co-invest with me by investing out of a fund structure. And the idea of micro funds became very popular. Silicon Valley is littered with them. Uh, you know, every founder who has their first exit starts their second startup, but also starts angel investing and often makes a micro fund now because it's the thing to do and allows others to come tag along who aren't insiders. So I'm kind of jumping on that bandwagon and um, I'm at the tail end of Emerging Ventures Fund One. We made 19 investments from the fund of 25 slots. So I have six slots left and then I'm gonna start raising fund two. and so we can continue that, but it's been great to be able to write slightly larger checks this way because I'm pulling the money of 30 LPs instead of just my own money. So I can write bigger checks, help the founders better that way, get better credibility from founders and other investors in the rounds. Uh, so it's been a win-win for everybody, I think, by using the fund structure. I'm very happy with that. Uh, back to your first question. Uh, one thing that no one knows about me, um, well, the only part that's relevant somewhat to my career in one way or another is uh, I was a weird nerd in, in high school. Um, I wasn't fitting in. And in my junior year of high school, I there was a program where one can take uh, uh, at the local university uh, classes. It's meant to get a taste of college. So they allow you to take actual classes and they'll give you a code as a first time freshman to go take up to three classes in the afternoon while you're in high school. And and you got dual credit. It was a special program. You got dual credit for those classes. You got the actual university credit, but you got to use them also towards your high school credit. And uh, so I did that. And at the end of the first semester, they're doing that. uh, A college counselor at the high school pulled me in one day and said, you don't belong here. You're doing well at the university. I talked to the counselor there. Uh, Go take this test on Saturday. It was like a Thursday. She's like, go on Saturday to this address, take this test and don't show up here anymore. That was a high school proficiency exam. So my joke all the time internally for the longest time is that I'm a high school dropout. but, uh, you know, so that's kind of the little backstory, which I haven't even thought about in so many years, because, you know, that was back in 1986. So it's been a while. Uh, awesome. It's a great story. Uh, we have similar backgrounds, but I'm a big fan of this schooling where you were able to jump into university. My God, I would have skipped half of my high school though if I would have done this that's yeah so I never had a senior year of high school so I I missed all that drama no senior prom or any of that stuff oh that's awesome I flipped schools all over because I played hockey and uh I so I was in different schools but I was done school in grade but I mean no grade 11 or 12 I graduated because I graduated sooner and then the rest of it was just a waste of time because I was doing it just because I was playing hockey uh, waiting for my scholarship to go to university. And then I just yeah. went to university anyway. So I, so I love the fact that you were able to circumvent right. all that. Well, in hindsight, and I didn't have anyone on the other side. And that's where having a good you know, family network helps. I can see that. I, I didn't have anyone to mentor me to say what I'm missing. Because if you go through the senior year and you get to go through the whole college application process, you can go to an Ivy League or try to at least and go through that yep. process. I skipped all that. I was at the local university. It was Cal State University, Northridge, which is just a local state school, which is fine. But, you know, um, that's what I wound up doing. And, you know, I I was there and I just stayed there and I finished it. I never had to really do the whole process. And I never got to see if I could have, you know, maybe gone to, you know, a Caltech or an MIT or Harvard or, you know, and, well, I'm going to Stanford say it worked out that. okay. You, you did all right for yourself. Yeah, sure it that, worked uh, out. That people always say, well, you know, <laughs> what school did you go to? And I have to, you know, I say, well, I stayed local. I went to Northridge, and that's what yeah. it is. Yeah. And I sold four companies. I'm going to guess you did okay. So there's uh, there's yeah. looking back and saying, would have Caltech or this other right. Yale would have been good for you? I think you did pretty good. Right. Well, the second academic story on that, and then we can always, uh, I'm also a PhD dropout, because when I was done with CSUN, I got admitted to, 
USC for a doctorate program in math. And um, the short version of the story is I decided to go into business and put that on hold for two years and see what happens because it just didn't seem like a good time to be an academic. And a lot of, you know, so I said, you know, I'm going I'm, to, I'm ahead by two years. I'll give, I'll start a business, give it two years, see what happens. If business doesn't work out, I can go back to school. And obviously I never went back to school. Uh, that's good. I, I'm a huge fan of schooling. I've done lots of it. And, and I look at it as uh, one day when I'm kind of past the, uh, if that ever happens, because I'm a huge fan and obviously love investing, but in early stage companies. But I also look at it as the one day I do want to have a PhD and I wanted to get that, not just to have the letters, but because I just have this fascination with learning. And I think it's kind of that next step. Uh, I agree with you on the learning. I do a lot of online stuff. I, I know I would not have the stamina to do the, to do an actual rigorous program. It's a lot of work. I looked at it. I went as far as talking to uh, admission counselors at different universities about their remote programs and online programs for doctorates. And it's basically three years of hard work. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, I'm not you know, I don't think I would have the energy to really see it through at this point. Maybe I, we can get you an honorary degree in entrepreneurship. That would be awesome. There you go. Awesome. Well, that sounds all amazing and uh, very exciting to learn more about that. And, and one of the things that really kind of piqued my interest is that in the bios and everything that uh, I've been learning about you is, of course, you have these four exits. And you've worked with, and in the early stage space, grown businesses into midsize. How much of what you're doing today has come from what you went through over the last 20, 30 years? Like how much learning did you take from working with investors and everything else? Did you raise money back in your, uh, in your other companies? Did you right. grow them grassroots and then decide, you know what, here's the learning I want to take from this and I can better help these earlier stage companies today with my learning? Um, the general business, side is definitely valuable. I think um, it's quite well accepted in the early stage venture industry that some of, that the best VCs often come from former operators. Uh, that it's harder, it's easier to turn an operator into a VC than to turn an, you know, a career-long investment banker or banker kind of guy. Uh, you know, so if you're going through um, you know, if you're, you're going through Goldman Sachs and you're an analyst or, you know, something like that and you want to go into venture, that's a harder transition. And I think the reason is when you've started and ran businesses where, you're, where you're, you're really were starting out as chief janitor, you're doing everything. You're it. You had to build everything from the ground up, uh, not coming from the enterprise world, but coming from a true small business background of any kind. Uh, then it is natural when you look at a fellow entrepreneur starting it, first of all, you, you know exactly what they're going through, but you can also see if they have what it takes. It's easier, I think, to underwrite the people to see if they're thinking about it correctly or not, because you, you just know what feels right and wrong instantly. And I can dismiss a lot of people who I think, you know, who I just said, no, this guy's not going to make it. He doesn't have what it takes because I can just feel it that, I've, I've done that and they're not it. They're not going to cut it. They don't have the rigor it takes. Um, on the other side, something a little more specific and technical is, as it happens to me, my background is all in underwriting. I was you know, and setting up underwriting models and thinking about deal selection. Uh, I ran an auto finance company for 18 years and we would look at, um, besides setting up all the models for it, um, we would look at back then, you know, 3,000 approximately, say, auto loan applications per month, 3,000 deals a month, and fund about 250 to 300. So we had that 8 to 10% conversion rate. Um, and we had to be very efficient in that. You can't take forever to do deal with an auto deal. Uh, but so it was really constantly thinking about how to do that efficiently and yet be good at it. Um, and I spent 18 years with that in my head, working on that constantly in the back of my mind, making that process better. On the other side, I ran an auto insurance company that was also an underwriter where we had to automate the underwriting and issuance of, we were actually at our peak issuing over 30,000 new policies per month. 
uh, we were writing a lot of business. Uh, the book of business was almost a half a billion when we sold the company to Kemper. There was over $400 million of premium uh, and there are small policies. So underwriting is just second nature to me. It's literally my whole life has been about underwriting models and uh, funding a startup and the deal flow process and all that is absolutely no different than auto loans. It's, it's, you know, it's just a tweak on it. You know, it's just all interchangeable. It's a slightly different product. You know, it's like someone going from selling cars to selling luxury bags or you know, whatever. You know, it's, uh, the product might be different. The, the interaction is the same. The concept's the same. Uh, the, the mindset, I guess, is what's really the same of looking at, but, so you're looking at a startup business and you're underwriting their chance to make it and see if they have what it takes. But the idea of un, that underwriter mindset has been so part of who I am. It's literally a core part of me now for all my whole life, my whole professional life. I'm a career underwriter. So, and always taking risks with my own money. It was my money in the auto finance company. It was my money in the insurance company. It was $400 million of premium on me, win or lose. Uh, I was responsible for the loss ratio, 100%. We had reinsurance, but that was, in a sense, a form of leverage. So it was all on me. Uh, so having being responsible for your own portfolio and making underwriting decisions for it, it really doesn't matter if it's auto insurance, auto loans, or startups. Uh, the only thing in startups is a lot more fun. I'd much rather be talking to genius entrepreneurs who are inventing the future and having them explain to me how to invent the future than to a finance manager at a used car lot trying to convince me why I should fund a particular de uh, you know, used car loan. Uh, it's just a much more fun conversation. And there's a lot more room. There's a lot more money. You know, on the auto loan, your, your revenue, what you're going to make, your upside is fixed. And but On the same side, though, with, even with it being fixed, uh, it's a guarantee probably higher guarantee in your outcome over a, you know, three to five year process. But I think at the same time, you can mitigate risk a little bit differently. Right. And also you're building a SaaS model. So you're kind of like the earlier SaaS model versions before SaaS models became big, yeah. because you really were working to get people to be paying monthly premiums, mm -hmm. um, yearly dividends. Like there's a lot of stuff that goes into building this book of business, yeah. which is even more, um, a, a right. lead into startups because startups work the same way. You're asking the same questions. You're trying Absolutely. to get them to find out if there's going to be monthly MRR, what's their ARR, how are they uh, going to build cash flow, right. all those things that they're necessities and you oh. learn really yeah. early on. I mean, looking at Excel models and trying to model out, you know, for projections and all that, uh, that's second nature as well. And, um, you know, so I'll say all that relates, all that transfers very naturally. So it actually wasn't a big transition at all. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's a very natural transition. Uh, to this world and it's just a lot more fun and a lot more room for error there's a lot it's actually a lot less stressful uh, you know on auto loan you can have maybe one out of 20 go bad you need 20 good ones to make up for one bad one so you have to be really really careful not to fund the bad one where it's almost turned on its head with startups you need it's not that you need one good one for 20 bad ones but you can actually assume that half your deals will fail and you can still turn out okay which is just an amazing leeway. It's an amazing breath to say, wow, it's okay to make a mistake here. I, you know, on, on auto underwriting, I was always under constraint that I can have at most one bad one for every 20 I fund. So you really cannot make mistakes. It's interesting you say it that way. Like when, uh, when I started on the venture side and early stage working over the last 20 years with early stage companies and then started investing and, and building a fund, what I what I annoyed me was that everybody will always say only one in ten will win. Everybody else will fail, and I thought, you know, why do you keep saying this? You're always putting the negative in this picture, and I think the the problem with that is that we all start to think that, and maybe that's just a tactic to reduce costs and fees for everybody so they can get in at a better value. But the problem with saying one in ten, I'm thinking, who in their right mind would want to come into this space with the fail rate right. so high? No, and, it, and it should not be with reason. Of, I mean, half of them and by failing, I mean, if we define fail, not as going out of business, but you define fail from a VC perspective as not having a positive exit. Correct. Uh, fail. I mean, they can stay a zombie for 10 years. That's still a fail. Uh, um, you know, 
uh, a fail is not having a positive exit for the investors at some point. So where you're not getting uh, up more than a one X back uh, at, into the fund during the life of the fund, then we would say that I think typical is 50%. And with good deal selection, if you're, if you're being aggressive and looking to unicorns, it might be higher. If you're yep. saying, okay, I only want unicorn potentials, I'll fund them really early. And I just need one to be 100x and I'm good. Uh, my philosophy is a little different. So I'm looking to have probably less than a 30% failure rate, but I'm also selecting uh, a lot of safer deals. I'm, I'm not funding companies too early. I'm waiting for some early traction. Uh, I want them to prove some product market fit and have some traction. And by that, you mitigate the risk. Uh, and also funding a lot of companies that will probably only have exits that are in the three to 10 X that are not necessarily going to be hundred X. They're not going to be unicorns. Some have potential to be, but most I'm okay funding companies that can never be unicorns. Uh, I just know that's going to have a good quick exit that within three years, I can have a five X that's also acceptable to mix into the portfolio to have, because my main goal is to get my LPs a three X blended return on the portfolio. So if I intentionally mix in a few five Xers that are safe, that are very unlikely to fail, but not likely to be unicorns either. Uh, they're more boring kind of investments, but that's more of the private equity mentality when they're investing at later stage, they're looking for three to five X returns in three to five years uh, on their each of their investments. Um, so I use a PE mentality on some of, to mix into this, even though it's an earlier stage, but it's okay to take a company that already has revenue and doing well. And I kind of see that founder is not running a unicorn. I see, but I see, say, Salesforce buying them for 50 million in three years if they continue on their, if, on their trajectory with their projections. You model it out and say, okay, yeah, I see you hitting eight to 10 million in ARR in, in three years. And I can see someone like a Salesforce buying you for about 50 to 60 million. And I'm investing at a 5 million pre, so that's not bad. It's like, I'll take that deal. Because uh, their likelihood of failing is pretty low. They're already almost break even on cash flow. So I know. love it. No, it's a, it's a, it's so a I've made a few deals. Yeah, I've made a few investments like that in the fund, which are not as exciting. They're not unicorn. I'm not unicorn hunting. But in that case, if you're making those kind of deals, you should not have anywhere near a nine out of 10 failure rate. You should have probably Agreed. a three out of 10, four out of 10 failure rate. Agreed. Well, the thing is too, is the, and what I like about the way you've structured this and, and uh, just as an example, um, we've conducted now 50 interviews. You're the second person that's looked at the environment this way. So why I love that is because you're actually trying to find returns for your investors versus trying to find a needle in a haystack that's going to be that unicorn return. You're looking at what businesses can I actually work with that can grow three times, five times that value so that those investors will receive money back, they'll get their payment out, they'll feel good, they'll reinvest in you, and then you can take bigger shots as you start to grow and, and continue to build that fund. And that's really what it's about, is the more you can return to your investors, the more faith they're gonna have in you. And if you've got a 10-year return on your fund, People aren't going to be really that excited. They're going to forget that they even invested in the fund. But if you've got things that are turning over every three to five years, the excitement builds. That's what's exciting. It's not about the fact that they, I don't know, they got a new spaceship that can fly people from door to door and it's a two-man uh, helicopter. Great. That might come out in 10 years, but that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for those businesses that are turnkey. Mm -hmm. Like you said, Salesforce can buy up. And that's a great, uh, great way to get behind your investors and get behind your startup. So I love that. It's awesome. And everybody needs a different way to fit into a market, right? You can have the unicorn chasers, you can have the stable ones that are going to give you returns, uh, or you can have the ones that fail. You're obviously picking, yeah. picking a good spot, right? Oh uh, yeah. And ideally I have a little bit of everything in there. So, you know, uh, I'm, not against, I'm not against looking for unicorns, but I'm not excluding safe, you know, yeah. safe triple. It's not only some runs, you know, some doubles and triples is okay too. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I love it. Uh, so taking this experience you've had working in this space, and it's obviously heavily over the last uh, 20 years that you've been diving in, working through your businesses and learning a lot. How much do you put that back into the startups? 
do you get the same opportunity to work with them from a VC perspective or is it more cash in and I try my best, but you know what, things are moving too fast. Uh, we do our best here, but how, how is that really right. like the audience? Uh, I'm, I'm a small check on their cap table. I'm not usually leading rounds. So I'm often not very involved to be honest with the startups after funding, but I try to help where I can. I make connections in my network, the potential prospects, even connecting startups to each other. I'm now an investor in over 500 different startups. So uh, you know, there's um, a lot that comes to mind when I see something new, I connect to something else in the space. And I was like, hey, you should talk to so-and-so. And I make warm intros. Uh, I've done a lot of that. I've, I've really connected a lot of founders to each other uh, for potential partnerships or just to chat. Um, also, I'm an LP and some upstream funds and downstream funds. So I've made connections to help found, fund, uh, help founders get introduced to, um, to uh, firms who can lead their Series A. And of course, I've gotten a lot of deals from funds where their incubator and accelerator programs that I'm a, a, a uh, LP in where I've gained the deal flow from them. So it works both ways. Uh, that's uh, I've been making, so I've been make, and I take a lot of deals and share them with other investors, including the angel networks that I'm a member of. So I've taken deals who didn't even, when there's say a million and a half round open, I might be writing $150,000 check from the fund. So if there's still another half a million open, I would say, hey, let me introduce you to Pasadena Angels. I think this will work. And I'm on the screening committee and we put that through the process. If I think it's compatible with that group. So I'm now bringing them a whole angel group who might fill up collectively with $25,000 checks each, the rest of the half a million, or at least a part of it. Um, it so I've done that too. I brought them investors. I, you know, I, I bring deals, deal flow to the angel groups. I bring the angel groups to the founders who didn't even know about those angel groups. Um, and I refer, I refer founders to each other. I refer founders to series A, VCs. I try to be active in the network that way uh, and never really looking for anything other than truly just trying to connect everything and be, be helpful wherever I can. And hopefully it's reciprocated. Uh, I think I get a lot back in reciprocation. A lot of people wind up just referring me things that might be helpful saying, hey, you know, yeah, talk to David. And um, it, it, it's great when, when people reach out to me and say, hey, so-and-so says I should talk to you. Uh, and uh, that feels great when people remember you, maybe because you referred them something recently and they remember you and now they refer you back something and it just, uh, it just you keep paying it forward. Oh, I love it. Uh, yeah, we have so many similarities there. It's crazy, but that's that's a very impressive. And, and I love the size of your network, but I love the size of the amount of companies you've invested in. Um, that's uh, that's phenomenal. And is there um, in this process that you've been going through? Is there a real touch point that you find really benefits when you make an investment? Is it the founder? Is it the type of business? What really hooks you into it? Because after 500 investments, uh, <laughs> you've got to find some secret sauce in there that you really get attracted to and, and maybe yeah. define what that is. Well, there's the 500 I'm in and uh, the tens of thousands that I'm not. Uh, yeah, I probably see 500 plus a month um, you know, through pitch days and everything else. And yeah, it got to a point where the no's can be very quick. So my first filter for myself is, you know, the 95% of everything that's not emerging tech. That's a quick filter. A lot of what comes to me, it's like, yeah, okay, that's just another business. You might do well with it, it might make money, but it's not what I'm currently looking for. So that's a quick filter out. Um, as far as the next step, and, and, and yeah, look at that, so it might not be for me sometimes. Now I might still look at them and say, are they a really quality founder? And should I try to bring that into, an, should I try to connect them to an angel group? Do they belong in Pasadena Angels? Would it help the group? Uh, so whether I like them personally, the business or not. So yes, I have to like the business. Uh, but then within the business, I have to think that that's the founder that's going to make it uh, for that business. So there has to be founder market fit. You know, founder, it's not just, you talk a lot about product market fit, but there's also the concept of founder market fit. And like, why is this person working on this business? And do they have passion about it? And do they have what it takes? A, to build a business and be an entrepreneur and B, 
to run this particular business? So one in general, are they a founder I like? And two, do I like them for that business? Um, and all that goes on instantly. You know, some, uh, sometimes you'll see someone pitch and you just, you know, you don't think they're an A-class founder. Depending on where you're, where that filter already is, you may not come across. Some places there's a lot of those. Other places there's none of those. I mean, if you're at a YC demo day, you're not going to have a lot of really bad founders. Uh, but uh, if you're at a, a local pitch day, you might see a lot of people who is like, okay, no, they, they have an interesting idea, but they need to bring a co-founder that can run a business. This guy can't run a business. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll get a team. I mean, I'll never, for example, invest in a technical product that doesn't have a technical founder. If they're going to outsource the technology and it's a technology company, I won't talk to them. That's a, that's a deal killer for me, for example. So there's a lot of things like that about the founders. It's like, I don't believe in, you know, someone with a sales background who is biz dev for their prior startup saying they want to do it, going out there and starting a new business. That's a technical business, but they're not technical. You know, they were an English major and they're great at sales, but it's like, okay, but if the CTO is not, bring on the CTO as a co-founder, give him equity. If, you're, if I tell them, well, who's the CTO? I say, oh, I have this company in the Ukraine and they're going to make the product for me. And it's like, well, where's the CTO? Oh, the, 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 the project manager in charge of the team there is the, CT, is the outsourced CTO. It's like, fail, that's it. It's like, yeah, no. You, you get yourself a, co he doesn't even believe, see the importance of the technology side of it. And it's just for him, a product that he's going to market. And no, thank you. You know, that's a deal killer instantly. So technical products need technical founders. Uh, and the uh, converse is kind of true though. Any business needs someone who can run a business. So sometimes the most technical founders aren't, don't seem like they can really run a business. There'll be too much of a learning curve for them to learn how to run a business. And that's through talking with them about business. And you're always like, okay, you might be a great engineer, but you're clueless about how business works. So get yourself an MBA co-founder. <laughs> Go across this, go across the hall to the business school and find an MBA. You know, get 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 someone from your network who's an MBA from your school to be your co-founder, and then you might have a chance at running a business. Or I'm not investing in you, and I'll straight I'll tell that to them sometimes. Like you know, that's a great idea. You're a great engineer, but you don't know how to run a business, and you're going to fail if you don't bring someone in who can. You need a partner. Go find yourself a, and then you know, someone MBA or MBA like as a co-founder that can help you run the business, or just someone who's run the business before, whatever it might be, even if it was a family business, but someone who knows business. It's too much of a learning. Some engineers can do it. They can go out and run businesses, no problem. But uh, others can't. So without spending some time with them, it's hard to tell. You can't tell on paper for sure. Uh, nothing on paper is going to tell you that. But seeing all these things and going through pitches all the time and you're able to get to know people really quickly and figure mm -hmm. it out, it sounds like in a way you're coaching and you're mentoring these early stage companies, regardless of the position they come in at, to really better understand who they are and what they're trying to deliver, giving them the facts of what you need in order to make an investment um, and then send them on their way. And if they come back, then there's a bigger opportunity for you if they're able to, to hit these key. Yeah. key points. I, I've had many, many I, hundreds of business of founders who I've spent a lot of time with, even though I knew I'm not going to invest in them. They're too early. And I was coaching. I was coaching them about the available um, incubator programs they should go to if they were really early and were a little clueless. It's like, okay, you need an incubator; they'll get you there. Uh, or the next step for the accelerator programs, or trying to tell them that what kind of co-founders they need, what they should do, that they should incorporate. You know, what law firms they should go see to set up their documents correctly day one, so they're fundable in the future. Uh, you know, if they're an LLC, making sure they know that they're going to convert to a Delaware C Corp sooner than later if they want to be venture backable, all those little things. But yep. yeah, everything I see, I do take the time. Actually, I did that this morning with a company who was an LLC and uh, some other things with them. They're out of Massachusetts. They have some great IP. I think they need to clean up a lot of things before they're venture backable. And I spent another 45 minutes kind of walking them through some of their options that they need to do before. The so I, I love the tech. I love your IP but you'll need probably four to six months to clean this up before you venture back a ball. And I love to stay in touch during that process. And here's some of the things you need to do. And then we spent about 45 minutes because they started asking me, they were coachable. They asked me a lot of questions and I just stayed on and 
because I walked them, I happened to not have a back-to-back appointment. So I walked them through a whole bunch of things that I would do if I was them and told them some things not to do. And they were about to go, they're in the process of contracting some kind of fundraiser, some kind of broker dealer, I guess, who's going to do, fund, who promised to, to try to raise $3 million. Now, mind you, these are at the pre-seed stage. They have, they don't have client one yet. They have a pilot, zero revenue. It's like, no, you don't go out there and hire someone to, re, to, to fundraise $3 million for you. Uh, figure out your, your, run, your, your run rate, your burn rate for the next 12 to 18 months. You probably need to raise a half a million to 750 as a pre-seed and do so on some kind of convertible debt now. And next year, you'll go out there and raise that two, three million at a much better valuation and without the broker dealer, but here's everything you need to do in between. And I can help you, but you need to do these things and then keep in touch with me and we'll We'll talk about it every month, and in two, in three, four months, you're probably ready, and then we can do the pre-seed round. And you know, it's you. Maybe I hear back from them, maybe I don't. These guys seem like they are going to follow up, and but I talk to hundreds of those, and you build a relationship, and eventually, maybe you find some of them, and if not, not. But uh, I'm trying to tell them what they need to do so they can have a chance of succeeding, at least from my opinion. And I hope they talk to some other people, uh, and you know, they either do what I say or they don't. But uh, uh, all I can do is try to tell them what I think and take my time to try to explain to them, answer their question. Well, I think it's a, you're doing a great job. It's fantastic. And, and that helped. I would think any, any startup just being able to have half an hour or an hour with you to go through that and learn a little bit more about something they probably don't have any clue and they're just learning as they go. I can't see how that wouldn't be valuable. Is there in this exploratory side of things, and you working with these startups, do you advise these startups that they should go in and get mentorship or they should look for someone local in their accelerator programs that they can tie into or find a, a one-off angel that can spend some time helping them? Do you think that this is really valuable for them before they come back to you? Because it sounds like you've kind of roadmapped them out with, here's a lot of stuff you got to do, but right. you know what? go find someone in your space that can really help you because in order for you to come back and really have us drive behind you, you need a lot more uh, learning and six months of this. Is that really important to you? Yeah, well, it's not one size fits all advice. So depending exactly who they are and what they're doing and what they're missing, I'll give them different advice. And for some, I really think if I was them, I would go apply to an incubator right now and that's the help they need. Uh, and if it's a clean tech kind of company, I was like, hey, go apply to, to Lacey or to wherever it might be, or, you know, um, some other companies say, okay, go to Techstars or 500 startups or apply to all those kind of accelerator programs because you just need that extra boost and you need all the resources. And you also don't have an, you know, at the end of the day, you have this bonus of getting in front of a bunch of investors. So it depends who they are and what they're doing. I don't often go say, go find an angel. Um, if that's, I, I, I don't know how to tell them to do that. I, if it's appropriate, I would introduce them to angel groups and walk them through the process and tell them what angels are looking for. And I spent a lot of time with different founders explaining to them the mindset of angel groups and how the process works with angel groups and when they might be ready uh, and how it's different from VCs and all that. And you know, so it, it, so it depends again on who they are, what stage they're in, what industry they're in, what they're missing to see, you know, from getting to know them in a short period of time, I try to, Say if I was them, what would I, you know, what would I do next? What would I need? And therefore, what do they not know that I should tell them to fill in the gap that will help them get to where they need to be so that they're venture backable? That's the end goal. But they're, you know, they're each lost in different ways. David, you're a good man. You're helping the environment out and you're helping a lot of startups figure their way out and, and get through the market. And I think that's awesome. Uh, and and uh, it's been a big help kind of you guiding us through the types of things. Um, it's unique. Most people don't get into the how and where you help, but I think it's uh, pretty phenomenal that you're able to dive into these uh, each of these companies individually and help guide them even with a little bit of time, uh, figure out where they need to be, and, and hopefully all of them find some minor success and come back to you and take investment as well. Thank you. So... What I think we're going to kind of transition to now is we have uh, our rapid fire questions. Oh, okay. Some of the questions you've, you've, you've added some insight into, but I think uh, we'll, we'll dive into those. And then we got a couple other questions there and we're going to hit some personal stuff and we'll make it a lot of fun. So 
First question. How did you get started in investing in early stage companies? Uh, well, we answered that. So short answer is after exiting my businesses, I wanted to be an investor instead of starting another business. Perfect. Uh, what's your favorite part of investing? Meaning founders. All right. How many companies do you invest in per year? Whew. Uh, the fund is investing in about 20 a year. Uh, me personally, I may invest in another 50 or so per year. That's amazing. Uh, all right. Any verticals you like to focus on? Emerging technology. Don't vertical agnostic, but emerging technology. As long as they're solving, using technology to solve a real world problem. It doesn't matter which slice of the real world. Okay. Do you have any due diligence requirements that you look for before making a commitment? Uh, yeah, a long laundry list. <laughs> okay. So you, you do, you spend time diving in, right? It's not just a concept oh, yeah. founder, you're diving deep into it. Well, everything else needs to check out too. And that's how, by putting them, by going through due diligence is how you could make sure you're not having 10 failures because you can weed out a lot of companies that may sound great, but have some holes. I mean, their cap table may be screwed up. Their legalese may be screwed up. Uh, they may not have the revenue they claim to have and so forth and so forth. Uh, you know, you, you, know, you want to make sure that, that everything is legit and that the documentation's all right there too. Uh, so yeah, the, the nitty gritty, you do need to take those few hours and do the due diligence and then have the back and forth on the legal and make sure that that's done right. It does matter. Agreed. Uh, timelines for investment from beginning to end of discussion to the end? Of um, anywhere from days to months, depending on uh, the, 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 where it is in the round. The quickest it can be uh, a closing round where there's amazing data room full of due diligence, a solid lead investor, and they had everything done. And it's either follow in or not. So you can take really just hours and look through the data room and say yay or nay, uh, that's the, and so that doesn't have to take more than two to three days to do the whole process down to funding. Um, and the longer ones, uh, tip, the, the typical is several weeks of back and forth and some due diligence, asking for documents, having a few meetings to review the documents and ask more questions. Uh, and then the longer ones are months where are just dragging out and maybe you're waiting for a lead or waiting to get more uh, co-investors in or just drag documents out of them uh, if you're early in the round and working with them. The longest ones obviously take years because it's the ones where they were too early and you're continuing to monitor um, until they're finally hit some milestones where you say, okay, let, now let's invest. Okay, no, all uh, good points. Uh, you mentioned the one about um, being a big fan of the, of the leaders, so that's good, uh, or the CEO. And you mentioned on the leading round side that you tend not to lead rounds, right. um, which is good. Is there any preferred terms that you like to invest on? Well, I prefer pre preferred equity to notes, uh, but at early stage, notes are often the way to go. Um, safes are okay. You know, uh, they became a standard. It's uh, I became, you know, it used to be a preference for notes over safes because we can control the terms a little better. But uh, you know, safes became a standard, simple way to do it. The new, the newer, not so new anymore. The last two year newer post money safe, particularly, I think, works pretty well. Okay. For very early stage, the early pre seed rounds, I think it's uh, maybe the best compromise is that post money YC safe. Okay. Uh, do you do follow up investments? In percentage of them? Um, not from the fund because it's not set up to. Uh, it doesn't have reserves. Um, so then from the fund, follow ons would either go into the next fund uh, or get uh, pushed out also to the LPs. Uh, we give our LPs the um, right to take those directly if they're interested in it. Um, and if I don't get that interest, I may set and don't have a second fund ready. I, may, I would syndicate some. I haven't had to do that yet. I normally just refer them out. Uh, or and um, on my own personal deals, it, it depends. Uh, uh, it really just depends. I'm not. Uh, it depends on the valuation and how comfortable I are with the direction the company took since the last time we funded them. So it, it, it depends on whether or not I'm still bullish on them at that valuation. Okay, makes sense. 
Uh, and uh, last question, do you take board seats? Um, as a group, we have. So I've, uh, the, so I'm not leading rounds, but a lot of times I'm in rounds where I'm quasi leading, where there is no absolute lead and we're kind of, I'm in the committee that's negotiating terms. And in that case, the group collectively gets a right to either a board seat or a board advisory seat, a board observer seat, sometimes advisory, sometimes observer. Uh, and if I, it may or may not be me, it's been me in a few circumstances. Um, I, I don't have any hard board seats. I have some board observer seats, personally. As a group, I'm in many, many deals that the group has a board seat, um, but it's not me. I choose, I, I don't ask to be, I rather not be. It's a lot of responsibility. Uh, so with so many investments, it's a lot of responsibility, both just commitment wise and legally, where I rather not have that on me. I might not ha rather not have to be an actual board of director member of startups that are unpredictable. Uh, it's bad enough being an investor. No, fair enough. Um, okay, so we're going to shift over to kind of more of a broader question or um, a deep dive into maybe some of the past investments you've made. But uh, one of the one of the things that we like to find out, or I love to learn about, is you in all of these investments you've made or companies you've worked with. There's always that heartfelt story where a startup has gone through the struggles of um, either really tough times and then just turned into a hockey stick growth or it was the totally opposite hockey stick growth and then the whole thing crashed. Mm -hmm. um, we're just looking for kind of that heartfelt story where just it was a turnaround or whatever you might think, whatever pops in your mind of something that just blew you away on what it takes to be an entrepreneur. And uh, just love to hear that type of story if you have one that comes okay. to mind. Um, I can give actual company name on this one. So I'll use this one because uh, they just got press release on it. There's a company called GoSite uh, it's from San Diego. And it's one of those that I thought would, would be like a triple. I thought, okay, valuation's good. This guy's running a good solid business, but it's really more of a pulse. So he makes, uh, he makes software to automate a lot of the processes for brick and mortar uh, companies. So everyone else is trying to help plumbers or this or that, the service guys. No one was doing it for the brick and mortar guys, like the physical hair salon or the physical... Uh, whatever it is, Dent you know, there's a lot of verticals that there's software for dentists, but there's no software for generic brick and mortar, uh, that turnkey everything. So he was doing that. And, uh, by the time we invested, he actually had some pretty solid revenue. He had a call center with like 25 people in San Diego and it really just became a sales business. Uh, so it was like, okay, it's a typical business. It's not really that innovative. And it, I didn't put it in the fund. I did it personally. Uh, because it wasn't emerging tech, but it was a cool business. And it was just a business. I was like, okay, someone's going to buy, he's going to sell to some kind of bigger aggregator. You know, someone's going to buy him out and it's going to three to five X my valuation and, and, and in a very short time, like two to three years. I didn't think he's going to even make it to another fundraising. I thought he'll get bought out. Well, he far, he, he somehow transformed himself into this amazing hockey stick of a startup started hiring like crazy and raising funds from top tier Silicon Valley venture capital to, to fuel it. They caught on to him and they fueled him. He did a series A, then a series B, like three months after the series A. And you know, the last round was, I think it was the B that pre-money was like 75 million and post was, it was right near a hundred million dollars. So it became a hundred million dollar business. When we invested, I think it was a $6 million business. So, uh, that was a, a surprise hockey stick because it's one that I thought was not going to be, that's that safe kind of 3X kind of exit in two years. And instead it's turned out to be a hockey stick, uh, Silicon Valley darling kind of business. So it's interesting. Uh, and COVID helped a little bit. COVID helped, COVID helped fuel some of the transition. I thought he was going to fail during COVID because brick and mortar stores were struggling and everything's, you know, but somehow that helped fuel their need for more of his software. So uh, it worked out beautifully. Amazing. Uh, you know, the founder made an amazing transformation personally, I think, from running a slow growth, slow business. He took like five or six years to get to just a couple million in annual revenue. And suddenly he just hockey sticked that thing in 18 months. Beautiful. Uh, 
big, biggest upside surprise. Yeah, and awesome. downside, uh, downside surprise, there was a, I had one COVID casualty. There was a company that I did in my fund. Ironically, it was a series C, not seed, but C like after B, A, B, C. Uh, and it was going to be one of those that, again, it was an enterprise uh, company doing tech to enterprise. I won't say a lot more about the, the specifics, but that's to keep a little confidentiality there. Uh, and they had government customers. It was a very mature company. They brought in new CEO from outside who knew how to run enterprise companies with the idea of basically having an exit, negotiating M and A deal at some point on that. Uh, so that was going to be another very safe one that should be maybe a two to three X, but very quickly because they're actually about to go to market. This is kind of a bridge round to get them there. Uh, but it was an actual priced round as a Series C. And there was a lead VC and everything. They raised in this round, they raised $10 million. I was only 100,000 of the 10 million uh, by 1% of the round. It seemed like just, you know, stabilize the portfolio, add this one stable company in there. It turns out that that's the one that like within eight months went bankrupt. Uh, they, uh, their, their burn was really high. And as soon as COVID hit, they're, they were burning a quarter million a month plus. And as soon as COVID hit, their sales pipeline went to zero. And so they panicked, tried to do some quick m and at a discount price. And they got screwed on the deal. Uh, the deal got cut in half last minute. We got 24 cents on the dollar back from our priced round. Everybody else got nothing. So language does matter, but we had the liquidation preference, the most recent liquidation preferences. So we got 24 cents on the dollar back. Uh, but that was uh, the most surprising loss or one to go bad really fast. Once it, but it was the most mature company in the portfolio, and yet it went bad the fastest. Wow. And sometimes you that saying, you know, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Yep. Yep, for sure. And that just could be planning and, and not a... Uh not pivoting or structuring yourself quick enough and fast enough or taking the insights from investors or team to make those changes. So yeah, it's a tough one. Very tough. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much for sharing that. The war stories are always good and helpful and make people think. Um, and now we're going to shift just quickly into a more personal side before we kind of finish up and uh, start off by um, what's your favorite sports team? Ooh. Uh, well, my favorite athlete, I'll answer that one because it's an individual sport. I'm a big tennis fan and my favorite, my favorite athlete is Rafael Nadal. I'm a lefty and I love that he's a fighter and I love that he's playing lefty even though he's a righty, but absolute favorite athlete is Nadal. Uh, yeah, he's pretty fantastic. Second favorite, yeah, Federer would be my second favorite. Yeah, those guys are both great. They, uh, they're very mature in the space and they certainly know how to deliver uh, – Excitement on the court. And off. All right. Favorite movie? And what character would you play in the movie? Oh, boy. Do I have a favorite movie? Um, I actually, there's a movie that I watched several times with my kids when it came out. I thought it was really cool. It was uh, Moana. Okay. Uh, it's a Disney movie. It's animated. Yes. <laughs> um, and I have kids that are now seven, you know, seven and nine. So, um, but Moana and, uh, you know, I, I love the grandma actually. All right. The, I don't know uh, if I can, I don't know if I can be her, but, uh, that character really resonated. We love, uh, we all no, love the can, grandma. It's your choice. It's your movie. It's your character. It could be anybody you like. I, I, I think that's the one with the rock in it, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a great movie. Uh, I don't want to be Maui, but I, I would love to, I, a lot more. I resonate with uh, with the grandma. Yeah, she was very insightful and guiding and everything. So, yeah, great, great character. Yes. I'm going to have to go watch that movie now because I can't remember all of the specifics on it when it came out. But uh, I do remember. If you, if you have younger children of any kind or grandchildren, that's a it's a fun movie. It's actually it's a, like a many Disney stories. It has a good moral to it behind the scenes, too, which might be too deep for them depending on their age, but the, it's fun for any age. For sure. Well, it also helps me learn a lot more about yourself and knowing the character that you pitch in there, I will now be able to better put it in context where I learn more about you. So I think that's great. Um, and I appreciate all the insights. And thank you very much again, David, today for uh, giving us a 
nice broad view of how and what you look for from investing. I love the fact right away that uh, you've invested and been in this space a shorter amount of time, but you've taken the reins and gone full force, invested in a lot of companies, have a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge, and uh, very excited that we got to, uh, to connect and learn about that. And the way we kind of like to end off our, our podcasts is I like to give you the last word. So if there's anything that you want to share to investors or to the startup community, uh, I turn it over to you to share that. And again, thank you very much for all your time today. And hopefully we can get you at our event on February 4th. Yeah, yeah. Oh, th thank you. Um, this has been great and i um, happy to do this. The, I, obviously, you can check out Emerging Ventures, Emerging.vc is the website. It's a little more background there. Uh, I can be found on LinkedIn or any, you know, or, or through Emerging Ventures. If anyone wants to reach out for me, whether they're founders wanting some advice or looking to pitch or wherever it might be, I'm open, always open to collaborate with other investors as well, US or Canada, so open to connecting. So yeah, no harm, uh, no harm in reaching out. And, you know, not everything's always a fit, but uh, anyone's welcome to reach out to me and say hi and uh, build a network. That was awesome. And, and I'm going to say it was brilliant. Uh, we don't every day, you don't get to talk to someone that's invested in 500 companies. Uh, he's totally surpassing um, any goal or expectation I had. I was always looking to make sure I could get up to that 100, 200 companies, uh, but 500 seems to be the new goal. That's amazing. Uh, big fan. I uh, just love all the things he's done, right? It's, it's uh, uh, his whole background and how he works on that passion and making sure that the founders really are a good fit. And that's what he makes his choices on. Um, and they want that emerging tech. So they're not looking for unicorns, but they're finding that middle ground where they're going to get three to five years out of a startup and, and get a, a good return. And I like that. He's looking for good returns for the investors. And that's what it's about. So David, thank you again for your time today. And everybody else, have a fantastic day. And thanks for joining us.